So I come to bring you a little bit further south, um, up in Alejandra's wonderful maps. Uh, so I want to, um, I'm doing a, a bit of a different thing. And basically what I'm studying, I'm studying what do penguins do when we're not looking. So um, uh, we, we want to, you know, Patagonia is the last frontier, but beyond the last frontier, there is still things to study. And um, there is um, there is there is a lot that we don't know about penguins just because and, and the Antarctic ecosystems in general just because being there uh, is just not possible for a great part of the year and even staying there for the good part of the year is still very expensive and demanding and all of the all of it. You can see the presentation well. Let me know. Yes, thanks. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's start. So why why are we doing this? Uh, why are we interested in this? So um, the main the main reason why we're very interested in this is because the 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 area that we study that is the Antarctic Peninsula. So this is all of the continent of Antarctica. So if you just we we are just studying the bit that is uh, on the top left. Uh, left-hand corner, that, that is the Antarctic Peninsula, that is the bit that is looking towards Patagonia, towards the area that um, Alejandra was studying. So that area, the Antarctic Peninsula, is uh, the second fastest warming area after um, some part in the Arctic that I don't know. I don't want to say which because you probably know more than about that than me. But anyway, it's warming very fast, like 0.6 degrees per decade. And actually, our data that uh, that we got from from our measurements, it, it actually suggests that it's even even faster. But well, we'll not go into that. Anyway, so we do study three species of penguins. We study the first one that we study is the Gen two. The Gen two is the biggest one of the three, and it's also uh, very different from the other two because it's a generalist. So the Gen twos can eat either a uh, krill, which is the little prawns that feed the Antarctic ecosystem, or fish, that actually in turn also feeds a lot on krill. But anyway. Gentus can switch from krill to fish, and that's no problem. If you can see, Gentus breed all over the Scotia Sea, all, of, all over this area uh, that is between um, the Patagonia, the Falklands, South Georgia, South Sandwich, South Orkney, and the Antarctic Peninsula. Then we have the chinstrap. The chinstrap is uh, the smallest one of the three, and it's possibly the, and it's, it's um, a krill specialist, a very, very strong krill specialist. And then we've got the Adeli. The Adeli is also, a krill specialist like the chinstrap, it, and it's a little bit bigger. But uh, if you check the maps between these two specialists, you have uh, the chinstrap being more of a maritime specialist, so more of a northern specialist, closer to the polar front. Uh, this this current between Antarctica and the rest of the world that Alejandra was talking about, and then you have the Adeli. The Adeli is a very very strong polar specialist. Very uh, is one considered one of the only two polar species. Uh, like true Antarctic penguin species together with the emperor penguin that spends the whole year there. Okay, so and regarding trends, uh, we are seeing that the gentus are increasing and actually they're moving further and further south into, into the Antarctic continent to areas that were previously only a dailies. This is something that we're just observing when you go there, that every, every year you go, there's a new little Gentoo colony, but there are gentoo colony, little gentoo colonies in places that there were no penguins before, and further and further south. Uh, however, chinstraps and adelis, they're both declining in this area. Adelis are increasing in other places, but in this area are declining. So we've got two specialists declining, one generalist increasing. We'll go more into that later. So what do we do? So we do have a network of cameras all around these places. So we have a network of monitoring cameras like the one you see on the right hand side at the bottom that basically take uh, in all of these places that you see on the map. So these cameras take one photo every hour of, of, of penguins and uh, 
we've had uh, these cameras going on for around 10 years in around 80 colonies. We don't have data for every colony every year and more colonies have been added through time. But right now we have kind of 80 colonies and the study has lasted for 10 years. So as you can imagine, this is honestly a lot, a lot, a lot of images uh, to check through. So we right now have around 5 million images. So even if I wanted during my whole PhD and actually the PhD of Fiona that came before me and did a lot of this work, um, basically we, or a lot of the work that has allowed me to do this now, uh, even if the two of us had gone through all of these images, we wouldn't have time. So we've got two methods to extract information from the photographs. One of them is using citizen science, what, what you can see moving on the screen, that is basically a web page that is called penguinwatch.org, part of this universe, uh, hosted by Oxford University, where people can come and click on uh, on images. We upload a little, small percentage of the images because otherwise it's too much for the volunteers. And these images tell us where are the penguins, where are the chicks, and uh, where are the eggs. So we are um, um, we, we extract information from that there. But we can only do this with a subset of the images. So the next thing that we've done is with the data uh, from the citizen scientists that we have gathered, we use um, we have created an artificial intelligence that tells us on every image where the penguins are. So if you um, these two images are uh, a, a, an actual image from the camera and uh, the output from the, um, uh, from the artificial intelligence. So you can um, you can actually look at where even where the penguins are uh, on the nests and um, on the image, if they're on the nest or not on the nest and how many are there, because this artificial intelligence also allows us to, to do that counting. I'm not going to go into how, but it, it does. And that is the that is the that is the part that we're going to use now, uh, or that I'm going to use in my studies. And uh, if you track one colony throughout many years, like for example, Spigot Peak for some chin straps on the left, or George's Point for uh, Gentus on the right, you can see that throughout the seasons, you can see when the penguins come and when the penguins go, and all of the fluctuations in the images. We're not going to go into what each fluctuation means, but uh, because what we're going to be checking up now and what uh, I'm checking now during my PhD is at the phenology. I'm going to be checking when do penguins, at least for now, it's just come, okay? Because that's already a big result. So in these graphs, you can tell that, for example, for chin straps is very, on the left, it's very, very easy to tell them, to tell when they've come. Uh, it's very easy to tell when they've arrived. And for gen uh, things are more complicated. gen you are going to see that they are, they are the generalists and they are also like, they have a lot of variety in their breeding season. You can already start seeing by looking at their, at their plot. Okay, so we're going to be looking at what are the determinants of, their, of the start of the breeding season, because we've seen this is important for other seabirds, uh, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. And we wanted to see what was determining the breeding season of the Gentus. So I'm going to ask you, please, uh, uh, this is uh, this. All of these results are being discussed in the Antarctic Council, or I mean, maybe they're not discussing these results. But this is part of the things that is being discussed. So I, I would ask you not to share this because this a this they are very preliminary results, and b is being discussed in policymakers. So please don't 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 share it outside. So um, what is happening to the breeding seasons of of these three? species. So we can see uh, that we've got three plots for Adelis, Chins, or some Gentus, and in each plot we see the um, how the arrival date at the colony changes with time. So time, uh, years, uh, seasons rather, are on the x-axis and arrival at the colony is on the y-axis with earlier dates being uh, lower. And we can see that for Adelis and Gentus, both species are adapting and both species are bringing their breeding dates earlier every year uh, significantly and constantly. In many colonies, it's almost a year-on-year -year thing. And in some of the more northern colonies, so more northern colonies are, have a greenish hue and southern colonies have a bluish or purplish hue, we can see that for these two species, um, it is normally for the northernmost colonies that the change is bigger, but, um, but it's, not, it's not significant. That is that just a hint. However, in Gentus, in Gentus, Gentus are a mess. Gentus, um, there is no clear pattern. There is 
if you just look at the southernmost colonies, the, the, the ones that are very, very purple, you can see that there's a general trend towards earlier dates in the in the gentu in the southern gentus, but um, if you look at it, if you look at the whole picture, that just does not add up. It's just it's just very bad. Uh, it's just very very varied, very varied. So there's no no conclusion that we can gather from that. Another conclusion that we have seen is that uh, for Adelis and gentus, we see a significant effect of latitude. So we we see that uh, northern more, the northernmost colonies uh, breed earlier and the southernmost colonies breed later. Although you can see that in, in Adelis is is quite neat, but in Gentus it's uh, it's it's very again there, there's so much variety, there's so much variance in Gentus that despite the result is significant, uh, there is nothing. There is um, the, the pattern is not that clear. It's not that neat really and finally we've got chin straps chin strap, uh, there is no pattern for chin straps um because and it's not significant because the chin straps all breed within two weeks so the variance is very very small and it's a bit pointless and finally we've got we've got temperature so if we look at how things how temperature has affected or the increasing temperature that we've seen already not a lorry coming through. No. Um, if we if we see what temperature, what, um, given that temperatures have been increasing in the area throughout the last decade, this we know from satellite imagery, uh, national program space uh, in weather stations, or uh, by the own temperature measures that we've got in the cameras, we can see that the effect of temperature is very, very, very strong. Uh, actually for the three species. Although Gentus, there are some colonies of Gentus that do uh, weird stuff and they start breeding later in warmer years. In general, it, it is very significant for the three species, especially for chin straps, the effect that uh, a warmer uh, a warmer years have on, on moving their, their breeding dates forward. So uh, just to 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 finish, I would just uh, I would just conclude that well, the timing of breeding is uh, just very very highly dependent on latitude. But colonies at every latitude are breeding earlier and earlier for breedings uh, for chin straps and adelis, uh, not for gentus. In gentus, there is no there is no clear year on year pattern. But all the three of them, all three species, are responding to warming by moving their breeding dates earlier and earlier. In gentus, is less um is less visual but it happens so in gentus there's so much variance that is more or less that the window in which their breathing happens moves earlier and earlier every year despite so if you take all of the colonies the window moves earlier and earlier despite there is great room for variance without that within that window so what we think it is happening is that basically since we are seeing this pattern of gentus breathing further and further south into a daily territory, into what uh, before was a daily only territory. Um, we are seeing now um, just a gentus coming into a daily only territory and we're not, um, and we're seeing gentus increasing and a daily is declining. So what we're thinking is that gentus are um, behaving as, um, as, a, as an invasive species coming in from the north into specialist land because they can adapt and eat krill if krill is um, available. They are out competing their krill, the other two krill specialists. And uh, that's that's it. We would like to thank to all of these people, thanks to which we are able to do research in Antarctica and move about and get cameras and all of that stuff. And I'm, I'm open for questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nacho. Great presentation and some wonderful visuals there too. Um, so same again, I'll open up to, to the floor. So uh, be bold and stick your hand up or, or drop a question in the chat. Um, but as before, I can get the ball uh, rolling. Um, so Nacho, when you when you um, plotted the, the, the timing against the temperature, were you taking the temperature in in the 
uh, region of all the different colonies. And, and I was just wondering what, if so or, or not, sorry, go ahead. So we, we take the temperature for, so the temperature that we're measuring this against is the temperature recorded in the camera. So uh, yeah. with every picture that we take, uh, the camera takes a recording, um, a temperature recording. So we're measuring it against the temperature measured at their own location. That's really cool. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask. But I, yeah, uh, it's cool that you, you have it directly at the, where the camera is. So um, we're, we're, sorry, we're uh, fighting a little bit with this because uh, we don't know how much, for example, if, when the cameras are in the sun, that is true that in Antarctica is very rare to be mm. in like directly in the sun. Uh, if there is a problem with overheating and that we might have higher estimates, mm. but and we're, we're working on that on 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 polishing on polishing those temperature measurements. If anybody has any advice on how to do that, please please stand up. I guess they're not uh, weather station quality temperature no. recorders. Is but there the is, could, for many things you, we don't have we don't even have satellite measurements because it's so cloudy. Yeah, I mean you could use reanalysis uh, data, so that that might be worth looking at, um, but. You get much finer scale resolution with your with your cameras, um, but it, it could be a, a useful sanity check anyway. I would, yeah. Yeah, um, we've got a couple of hands up in the audience. Uh, Maria, would you like to go? Hi, thanks, Nacho. Really great talk. Um, so, I was two things. Uh, you mentioned the the gentoos being invasive species, potentially outcompeting the other creole specialist penguins. Um, yeah. Is this uh, like you can obviously see when they appear in the cameras, but is there any other way that you could like the cameras and the AI could pick up this? Like, would there be like direct aggressive behavior or is it just very much being in the same place and now competing them? Okay, sorry, is that there's a lorry coming through and... <laughs> sorry, can you repeat Maria? Yeah, yeah no worries. Um, you mentioned the Dodentus being invasive species and that you can see them appearing in the same frames and shots as the, as no, the other not, species? No. Not on the frame shot, no. So they are okay. appearing in areas. Uh, this is not something that we've got in the cameras. Okay, okay. They are appearing in the areas. So when we go to set up a camera in a chinstrap colony, sometimes it's like, but wait, in this colony, there were no gentoos and they might not appear in the cameras because in the camera- mm -hmm. you, But you see them when you're there. Yeah. But, you, but you see when you're there, you're like, there was, there were no gentoos here or like there were <laughs> like, few gentoos or or when you when you move about in the zodiac there's like okay maybe it's not in the same colony but there was not a gentoo colony there and i've not been that further south i've never but in the um, just as you cross the polar circle that used to be a no no go for gentoos and now there is apparently very big colonies of gentoos being established there we we just don't have the means to to reach there to to study them better but there's um, these colonies have established like five years ago and they are already like of hundreds of individuals so i guess it shows it's always good to have some kind of ground truth thing because you get you pick up these biological things which you might just not see in your cameras for whatever reason yeah mm -hmm. cool thanks yeah. and actually from the cameras what we see is that because gentus generally arrive well, if we go to the to for example to that to that plot you can see that gentus Per latitude, if you look uh, per latitude, the Gen two line arrives way earlier than the Adeli line or the or the or the chin straps. So the Gen two generally arrive earlier than the other two species. And sometimes in the cameras you can see that you get a, a a signature of penguins coming very early, and it's like, oh, this is odd for you know, given that you know this is a chin strap colony. And then you look, and it's Gen two's coming, and then uh, chin straps or Adeli is kicking them out of the very nest spots. And uh, so they, there is there is really a competition for space there, and on land Adelis and chin straps seem to be winning, but on the seeds where we fear that they're losing. Thanks. Thanks. Mark had his hand up earlier. I don't know if Mark you had something to say. Um, yeah, very short, but uh, yeah, I would. I, I wanted to support uh, Sam's uh, suggestion, and perhaps it's not about. Um, um, replacing the reanalysis data, uh, but perhaps for some regions where you might have some good, good grounds for comparing, it would be nice to see a comparison so that you basically can claim that those measurements overall 
fit with either observed or reanalyzed data. But apart from that, uh, thanks for the talk. It was great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much because that's that's very good advice. Okay, Alejandra. Okay, uh, Nacho. Uh, what about the competition where we had sea lions, sea elephants, and fishing ships? That is a very good question. Yes. So with, with sea lions, so there is not there is not many. The only um, there's not many seals down there. Um, in the mar more maritime islands, in when you go further north, there is there is more, but there is mostly like fur seal, um, for uh, immature fur seals. Um, mm -hmm. They say that then they go and, and try to breed in South Georgia, um, and then there is a, there is a lot of uh, weddell seals. There is a lot of. Um, um, the big scary one, leopard seals. Leopard seals. Oh, they're so scary. And uh, <laughs> but we don't know. We don't. We have no idea about the competition with other animals, and the competition with fisheries. Yes, that is something. So in the next chapters, I would like to look into uh, breeding success because we're going to try to isolate in those those images that you've seen from the AIs. Uh, we're going to try to isolate penguins nest by nest. So we're going to try to uh, get a measure of breeding success and measure breeding success against, uh, for, for example, fisheries. I would love to do that. Mm. Especially that's a very hot topic right now. How much fisheries impact totally. breeding? Yeah. It's not, mm -hmm. very, it's, it's, there's no clear sign and I think we can get it. Yeah, it seems that it's a problem. I've seen a documentary of uh, National Geographic about it, and it seems that uh, the, 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 the stress is, is huge. I mean, they're mm. the same resource, so there must mm. have an impact, but yeah, mm -hmm. not been Thanks. that much done in there. In that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mark? Yeah, sorry, another question. Um, uh, I might have missed it, but um, is there scope uh, with the use of artificial intelligence to start tracking individuals? So it's, oh, it, that's, that's a big question. Uh, we, so we do, the cameras that I've shown you, they do have a very, their temporal resolution is, so I don't think, I don't think you could track individuals in the sense of, um, you could tell apart, for example, two, pair, two, two members of the pair you could tell like the female and the male in the in the nest you could i don't think you could do that because honestly just when you're standing there i don't think you can tell apart and i think if if the eye cannot tell apart artificial intelligence can't as a rule of thumb they might pick on on other stuff like small differences in size or or even behavior like i don't know the males look the male look more like this way and the female of this pair looks more like that I don't know. We could we could do an unsupervised classification to try. I had not thought about that. Mm, but but it's difficult. I find it difficult. Thanks. Yeah, interesting question. Um, okay, we're we're basically at the end of the hour, but um, I wonder if I could uh, ask one more question, which is: uh, Do you think that your cameras um, capture? everything um, and if not how much are they missing and, and to what degree like with uh, Alejandra's uh, giant kelp are the, are the locations of these colonies controlled by the landscape and therefore you kind of know where they'll always be. So that is a question that we're trying to not me but the research group because for me cameras is already a lot um, but we're trying to answer with uh, drones so we have started um, because the more obvious uh, reply is like, what are you missing from the cameras? Well, what is just outside your field of view with the camera? And uh, and yes, there's a lot of questions on how do penguins, on how do penguins um, relate to the to the colony space? So uh, one lo long standing question is like, do do penguins at the outskirts of the colony do worse than the penguins in the inside? What is what is the advantage is that they're more exposed to predators, like for example, to giant uh, skuas or uh, sorry, giant petrels or, or skuas. 
but um, but it's not clear if they do better or worse, if they arrive earlier or later, if they um, if their phenology is different. So we would like to look into that this year by doing a very um, this year I might go to one research uh, base uh, in Antarctica on Deception Island with the Spanish Antarctic Survey and spend there the whole season and what would be taking um, drone images routinely of the colony and see how it evolves during time. I think that that would be very, very interesting. Cool, that's great. So, so do you know if, they're, if they're, the colonies are generally constrained by the landscape to be in certain locations? Presuming that's where you put your cameras, where you generally mm -hmm. find them. So we we put the we put we are limited by so because we we don't we don't travel around by ourselves but we travel with a cruise uh, company that um, that basically it's a tour company that they so whenever when they are interested in going with the colonies with the most penguins and we are too so we kind of go go where the tour companies go the most so we're limited in that way and about penguin limitation geographically. There's not a lot being done on that, on why do penguins colonies are where they are, except for emperors. And emperors have been shown to kind of uh, be around Antarctica. It's been shown to be like a big emperor colony. And I think it's like 500 kilometers away, a small emperor colony and kind of like a, then a big emperor colony um, in that sort of pattern, kind of 500 kilometers apart throughout the whole circle. And I think that's, to the best, to the, my knowledge, I think that's the, um, uh, the best thing that I can have for you respond, responding to that question. Well, thanks very much, Nacha, and thanks for a great talk again. Thanks to, to both our speakers. Um, so, yeah, we've reached the end of our time. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us today and, and throughout the, the rest of the week. Um, I hope you agree that it's been a really fun week and we've got to hear about lots of different um, bits of research going on in the university from our early, re early career researchers. So, uh, yeah, I'm delighted that um, we could all come together to, to share that this week. OK, well, thanks again and uh, hopefully see you soon.